Do you want to learn more on how to put money to work in regenerative food and agriculture? Follow our video course via investing in regenerativeagriculture.com slash course or in the links below. Now on to the podcast. This interview is about risk and hidden risks and why an agriculture economist, after looking at unburnable carbon and stranded assets in oil and gas, is now looking at soy, wild fish, fish farming and soil. Welcome to another episode of Investing in Regenerative Agriculture, Investing as if the Planet Mattered, a podcast show where I talk to the pioneers in the regenerative food and agriculture space to learn more on how to put our money to work to regenerate soil, people, local communities and ecosystems while making an appropriate and fair return. Why my focus on soil and regeneration? Because so many of the pressing issues we face today have their roots in how we treat our land, grow our food and what we eat. And it's time that we as investors, big and small and consumers, start paying much more attention to the dirt slash soil underneath our feet. In March last year, we launched our Patreon community to make it easy for fans to support our work. And so many of you have joined as a member. We've launched different types of benefits, exclusive content, Q&A webinars with former guests, Ask Me Anything sessions, plus so much more to come in the future. For more information on the different tiers, benefits and how to become a member, check patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or find the link below. Thank you. So welcome to another interview. Today I'm joined by Matt Medlucky, Head of Research and Mark Campanale, Founder and Director of Planet Tracker. Planet Tracker's focus is on the global industry sectors defined by significant investment flows and revenues in the context of planetary boundaries that are most threatened. This includes regional and global industry sectors such as agribusiness, plastics and textiles. Welcome, Matt and Mark. Thank you. Thank you. And to start with a personal question I always like to ask to both of you, actually, what led you into being part of Planet Tracker, finding Planet Tracker and working on these extremely large land use and also sea use, actually, industries? So from my point of view, I trained as an agricultural economist um, about 30, 32, 33 years ago. And I did my master's thesis on environmental cost accounting techniques, quite quite try but what I was trying to work out is if you factored in natural capital into the way you did project evaluation as an investor how would it return how would it change the return on investment and could you reduce the inputs like chemical inputs in favor of natural inputs by valuing nature better I never thought I'd find a way of using that degree that master's degree but um, I ended up going into the city into finance and what I realized is that financial markets are very sophisticated, uh, whether equity markets or debt markets, but they're not actually that good at understanding planetary limits. So there's no real pricing mechanism for air, for uh, water quality, for, uh, for even the land upon which we depend for food production. Um, and so there's no real proper value of that. So it struck me that we've got to f- work out the tools um, to think about this. And there was a lot of academic work around natural capital. There's some fantastic work done by people like Sivan Sukdev on, on natural capital and, and the UN and others talk about it and economists talk about it. But it isn't really properly understood through the lens of financial markets. So I set up Planet Tracker with my good friend uh, Nick Robbins, who's a professor of uh, sustainable finance at the London School of Economics. And um, Nick and I set it up really just to try and address this. So uh, what it means simply is that we look at, uh, we try and look at all the fisheries and seafood companies that are listed on stock exchanges around the world. And we try and look at, say, water businesses and forestry businesses and food and agricultural production businesses. Um, And how do markets value uh, those companies and do they incorporate planetary boundaries and do they understand the value of natural capital and, and what are the what are the constraints um, in the future and what would this mean for business models? So that was the that was the reason why I set up Planet, Planet Tracker and I was delighted that uh, we've been supported by some terrific foundations um, and that allowed me to meet what are now great colleagues like like Matt and Robin and the rest of the team um, that form the heart of Planet Tracker. Brilliant. Thanks, Mark. And and my story is is somewhat different. Uh, a bit like Mark, I, I started my career within within the city, within finance, uh, working for a large institutional Swiss bank. And I realized that actually within that bank they were they were launching a, a series of 
of research pieces around the new paradigm shift of of where capital markets would would be deploying um, large scale funding in in the future, and this was in around two thousand and five. And those themes really uh, they resonated with with my personal um, feelings about about the environment and about the planet, and and looking at the sustainability of water, sustainability of agriculture systems, the sustainability of of food systems and and consumer trends. And and really, whilst the research was was extremely compelling, uh, there was very little financial product available in the marketplace to actually um, enable investors to support the the sustainability trends or or these mega trends. And I actually spent 10 years um, managing conservation finance funds uh, and setting up conservation finance funds, mainly in Africa and, and also in Europe. And through investing in businesses that were really at the, the forefront of, of driving sustainability and specifically around landscapes, around biodiversity, we realized that, that these businesses were, were facing some pretty simple barriers to, for scaling. And that in order to actually um, generate the, the 300 billion or so dollars worth of, of conservation finance required to conserve the planet's natural landscapes, um, we had to engage capital markets. And so with that, with that sort of view, I, I came back to, into the city um, to join Planet Tracker to really look at how we can le- leverage capital markets in terms of uh, asset managers and asset owners. So we're looking at pension funds. We're looking at large-scale insurance-based investors. We're looking at the asset managers um, as as custodians of their money and and their investment decision-making and and looking at how they engage companies and can support companies to operate more sustainably. And, And so through that and through the lens of both equities and also fixed income, um, we are hoping to, to really shift the dial in how capital markets deploy their money, um, how capital markets research and value um, risk and return, and, and really start looking at, at generating significant amounts of funding um, for, for the environment and for sustainability globally. Uh, it's extremely interesting. Thank you for both of your introductions. And as in the podcast, we mostly look at I would say the positive side or the potential of agriculture and land use and sea use and the restoration of soils, et cetera. But I think the risk side of things and the current degeneration of most of natural capital is something we don't discuss often enough. So what is it, something that, I mean, you've been, you've been around for not very long, actually, I think a year or two. The first report was actually published in, in about three years ago, two and a half years ago. Oh, wow. um, and that was Fish Tracker. So originally, after I'd created Carbon Tracker, which is the climate-focused nonprofit, um, I began to start thinking about um, seafood. And the trigger was finding a Chinese uh, seafood company listed on the London Stock Exchange, which I, I thought was fascinating, that we think the problems are located on the other side of the world. And you don't have to look too far to, to discover, that actually, from a financial point of view, they're, you know, they're often based in our hometown. So we did a piece of analysis to say how many seafood companies are there listed on the world stock markets. And we found some 227, which came as a bit of a surprise to a lot of people, because that's actually quite a few companies uh, involved in fisheries, catching wild fish, and so on. Um, And so that was the first report. And and, um, what we concluded was that um, that, uh, there are far more boats out there trying to chase the fish than there are fish that can be caught. Uh, within a sustainable basis um, and that uh, equity capital markets were central to how these companies were being financed. And so after the success of the launch of Fish Tracker, uh, I decided we would absorb it into Planet Tracker and then Planet Tracker in turn would develop programs around textiles and, and water and, and food and agriculture. And so that's really the genesis of it. But I've got to say, we didn't really get going until Robin Millington and, and Matt McClucky here joined and uh, allowed us to build the team. And now we're, we're motoring along at a good pace with a lot of um, uh, ambition for what we can do, just because a lot of this research just hasn't been done. Um, the research report that we launched today uh, on shrimps, um, there are 27 stock exchange listed um, shrimp farming businesses, 
um, that are owned by, you know, household name insurance companies and investors. That people listening to your podcast today um, will probably have these companies in their pension fund, typically. Um, and so we're the first without knowing, obviously. Yeah. yeah, no, they wouldn't know. And and doing this kind of analysis, I think, um, you know, the the ESG sustainability industry is a huge industry we're now employing thousands of people around the world. But there's still some new frontiers of unknown, undone research. And I think you know this new shrimp paper is just an example of that. Would Would, would you agree, Matt? No, I, I definitely agree. And and. Part of what we do is when when we look at, for example, the global food supply chain and and actually the integrated value chains is is that often capital markets aren't necessarily aware that they're exposed to some of these companies and there's a low degree of transparency through which these companies are operating um, in terms of how they report to capital markets and and a company which is actually offers a very good example but also is a, a good example of of strong sustainability in terms of sort of their their reporting and actually what they're trying to sort of do in terms of moving the dial of how they report to capital markets is, is a group such as Mitsubishi. Mitsubishi is such a large uh, global corporation and they produce um, a whole swathe of different products from white goods to electric vehicles to renewable energy technology, but they're also one of the largest fishing companies in the world uh, and controlling a fleet of vessels as well as processing operators and as well as distribution companies. So, so I think it's important to actually just educate capital markets around actually what companies in their portfolios are, are doing um, across the world when it comes to, to the environment and, and actually how they can work with managers of those companies to, to create um, you know, more sustainable, sustainable management of resources. And a very good example of that, I think, stems um, from some later work that, that we published at the back half of last year in in uh, in Japan, where, <coughs> excuse me, out of, out of the 228 global uh, listed fishing companies, we know that approximately 41 of them are, are domiciled in, in Japan. And what we've seen with Japan is that actually, in terms of total fish production um, within their wild catch seafood industry, production peaked in the mid 1980s. So in 1985, Japan was producing around 12.5 million tons worth of seafood every year. In 2017, that number had dropped to 3.3 million. So, so you're roughly, you're looking at um, a discount of over two thirds or decline in over two thirds in terms of total um, production. What we've also seen, however, though, is that if Japanese fisheries alone were managed more sustainably, it would generate an extra $5.5 billion um, in terms of fishing revenue. And so, and if you extrapolate that number out on a global basis, the FAO have said that if global fisheries were managed to achieve maximum sustainable yield, it would be worth an extra $51 billion to, to global economies so, or to the industry. And so what we're actually finding is that there is a direct financial incentives for portfolio managers to actually start engaging with companies within their portfolio to operate more sustainably because this represents it's not downside risk this is opportunity upside and and that's an important feature that planet tracker likes to 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 sort of that distinguishes us and that we we are looking for the positive um, upside approach with these companies and and the solutions for the finance community to actually engage companies on yeah, I think it's it's extremely interesting that you make that switch from risk to to opportunity. And something you said before, uh, Mark, and, and also actually Matt, like there are more um, there are more fishing vessels chasing uh, than there are actually fish to to catch at the moment, as they are not managed. Most of the fisheries are not managed sustainably. That's something that I think uh, not only is a huge risk if you suddenly find out, like, look, if we have all these companies chasing the same fish probably that's not going to work out, but it's something very similar eh, to think of, of the carbon tracker story, which is obviously a lot older. Like there, there's more coal or there's more uh, CO2 or there's, there's a lot of stuff we cannot burn. Um, is that that's not a coincidence that that's the same, uh, basically. That, but it is interesting that nobody ever did that research. Like uh, how much do we actually have? How much is on the balance sheet? And how much fish are we tracking or fishing? Or how much carbon are we trying to burn? These are good points, and we're still trying to some of this, which we're still trying to figure out. I, I remember um, in the early 90s when I st first started thinking about this, I was looking at some stock exchange logging, forestry logging companies that were logging tropical forests in Asia. And 
there was a particular company Maybe against the same. <laughs> well, <laughs> yeah. Well, well, I tell you what was happening was that the the investors were valuing the company on a price earnings multiple. So they were saying that this year they generated 10 million in revenue. Say, for example, next year it's 15 million. The following year it's 20 million. And they were valuing it on a price earnings multiple, sort of giving the indication that actually the best way to come up with the value of the company is to sort of say these these cash flows are growing um, and uh, it will continue to grow in the future. So it's got to be a really valuable company. Now, what, what they didn't know, and this was where the interesting thing came in, is that the logging company was taking a quarter of the commercial trees out of the forest each year. So after year four, there were no more commercial logs. The forest was trashed. And um, so you, you couldn't use a PE price earnings multiple. So this analyst came out with the report and said, well, actually, this is all a, an illusion of number work that you've got to evaluate it on a, on a sort of depletion play where you're sort of saying, OK, each year you're removing 25 percent of the value each year. And at the end of year four, there are no more revenues. Um, so they put this, this analyst, I remember, she put this sell side out, no doubt, with a new valuation that essentially said, instead of the stock price being $20, it's going to be 6 And pandemonium broke loose because the investors suddenly realized that after year four, this particular business was going to have no more revenues from logging forests because they'd logged out the forest. And it very neatly told a story that markets discount future cash flows, but they are unable properly to price scarcity. Uh, of natural resources and um, and we use the wrong methodologies. So if you look at, say, seafood, uh, investors assume, you know, we, you know, we hear this phrase, there's plenty more fish in the sea. Our, our grandmothers were using that phrase. Well, I'm afraid, folks, that's no longer true. There aren't plenty more fish in the sea because we've been taking a lot of it out. Um, and investors have this strange assumption that you take one fish, there's going to be plenty more there next year. And if you build one boat to catch fish, uh, if you built 10 boats, you can catch 10 times as much fish uh, without realizing that you hit these these boundaries. And and really the heart of Planet Tracker and its research and its approach is really to sort of say, well, look, you know, we can't run the world thinking along these lines. Markets have to change. Uh, investment analytics have to change. How we model risk has to change. Um, and ultimately, consumers and investors and, and the companies themselves have to rethink this. And, and we've got to stop this plundering of the oceans and plundering of the atmosphere. And investors, normally quite conservative people, um, and if we put in, if we measured risk better and we put in place better practices, then a lot of this, a lot of these problems are not going to go away. I think we would find better ways of dealing with the sustainability challenge. I really like the the switch to you. They're not modeling, or we are as as a species not modeling in scarcity. And we sort of saw the forest. Now, hopefully, that changed. But saw the forest as an endless amount of trees, and well, see yeah. still the sea as an endless amount of fish because we don't really see how many are actually down there. Probably we get really really scared. I mean, what you did the modeling, yeah. like how much of decline we actually already hit, and we just put more boats and more boats and more boats. Yeah, exactly, exactly, and. and uh... And what we found um, um, in the meetings that we've done with different investment firms, and we've met with some large pension funds, and we've met with a number of investment managers, is, is a lot of people are getting this. I think um, there has been a change in thinking in the last five, 10 years. A lot more analysts, a lot more investors are getting it. I think it's true particularly of Europe, particularly of um, the Scandinavian uh, countries and, and, say, the Netherlands. I would, I would say it was... It was uh, especially well known in Asia or perhaps North America, but it's growing awareness in Europe. And, and um, the good thing about the Internet and communications is we can begin to distribute this research uh, further afield. And where we can, we try and publish in local languages to allow a pickup of the analysis. And, and we see, you know, this is a... Um, this educational thing is going to take some time, but we've got some things, we've got some tools that work in our favor. So one of the things that does interest us is, is can we get stock exchanges to require uh, better disclosures by listed companies? So if you if you want to raise money to log a forest or to, um, to, to build boats to go fishing, do you properly disclose the sustainability profiles of the fisheries you operate in or the forests you log in? And can you present sustainable forestry management plans or resource management plans and and uh, there's a role there for good regulation and good disclosure and, and a good accounting systems 
And I, I also added to that, one of the the key tools that we're seeing huge leaps and bounds in is the availability of high quality environmental data and the translation of that data into metrics that, that capital markets can actually use. And there's some incredible companies such as Planet Labs, who are a, a satellite data provider, who now we can start looking at soil profiling at a very granular level. We can start looking at um, water at a very granular level and start determining how when you've got agricultural companies that rely on soil productivity, when you've got brewery companies that rely on the availability of, of, of clean water, um, we can actually start, start modeling and pricing um, in the short to medium term, actually how the availability of that natural capital is, is trending and start working with companies to ensure that they can, ensure that they can maintain the sustainability of, of those resources. And so I think capital markets are, they've, they've got more tools at the disposable than they've ever had to be able to look at valuations in a new way. I think where capital markets actually need to do maybe more work is, is the education of analysts, the education of, of portfolio managers and, and, and asset owners around how to use those tools. And fundamentally, to look at the metrics, um, and these we're talking about um, economic fundamental metrics, and how does the environment interrelate relate with those metrics? So, uh, we've launched a, a paper, for example, looking at balance of payments, um, which is a, a key metric in in determining um, sovereign credit risk, and just looking at how. Um, the production of, of soft commodities in the country and those that production relies on the availability of soil, of water, etc. How that actually inputs impacts the production of commodities, which has a subsequent impact on balance of payments. And so we can be looking at these linkages and actually starting to educate analysts and working with analysts on, on how they can start pricing environmental externalities and, and natural capital values into their research. Yeah, I actually wanted to, that it's a great bridge to the project you're doing on sovereign bonds. Can you unpack that a bit? I will definitely link all the information below in, in the show notes, but can you unpack a bit what that means in practice? You've looked mostly at Latin America, if I remember correctly, and really tried to make the connection between the natural assets or the natural capital that these countries have and basically their export focus sector on the agriculture and, and the risks there. But can you unpack a bit for people when that, that are not immediately thinking, oh, these are sovereign bonds, how that works and what the research is that you've done there or the project that you're doing because it's a much longer one? Yeah, so, so very simply, we're working on a joint project with the Grantham Institute of the London School of Economics to look at the connection between the environment, natural capital, um, and essentially sovereign bond risk. And, and we're primarily, we're looking at, um, at credit defaults um, and interest rate risks. And uh, using funding provided by the Gordon Betty Moore Foundation through, through the Finance Hub, we focus our initial research on uh, Brazil and Argentina. And let me just um, highlight the case of Argentina here. Is Argentina, as we know, um, macroeconomically has has had a rather tempestuous recent history. And in 2018, that culminated in the, the International Monetary Fund, the uh, IMF, actually issuing a, a $56 billion um, bailout standby agreement to, to the economy. So in, in essence, if you factor in also sovereign bond investors into Argentina, and, and there's been um, a, a, actually, there's been a, a huge impact on, on sovereign bond yields just um, through the economy over the past six months. Argentina effectively owes um, a considerable amount of US dollars, both to the IMF, but also to sovereign bond investors. Now, when we look at um, what generates uh, essentially net income for the economy of Argentina, 70% um, of Argentina's exports rely on natural capital in their production. It's very much... 70, right? 70. 70. Yeah. So, wow. and if we, if we look across the G20, so Brazil, Argentina, and Indonesia are the top three countries that rely on natural capital export, based exports to generate economic growth. And so with the case of Argentina, it's, it's very much an agricultural-based economy. And two of the, the main agricultural products are um, soybeans and livestock. And what we've seen is that actually there's been a huge amount of deforestation of, of the Cerrado and of um, forested areas to create landscapes for the production of soy and the production of livestock. 
And the soy is very important for the economy because it gets um, exported in not only raw form, but also gets processed into, for example, biodiesel. And 60% of Europe's um, biodiesel is actually originated from, from Argentina if we're looking at soy-based biodiesel. And so what we've seen with Argentina is that they've got this big um, US dollar uh, deficit or liability sitting on the on the national balance sheet. They've got a low US dollar um, level of treasury reserves. And so therefore, they rely on generating positive US dollar based balance of payments to actually service those liabilities. Now, if we go to the droughts which Argentina had in 2018, we know that that, those droughts had a significant impact on the production of soybeans. And if you look at actually the cost to that, which has been cited by credit rating agencies, is that generally they account for about $14 billion worth of lost balance of payments receipts coming into the economy. Now, Argentina defaulted on an $8 billion payment to the IMF, resulting in um, or triggering another release of standby agreement funding. So if that drought hadn't taken place, or if the sector had been more resilient, then actually you could argue that that standby agreement um, trigger would not have, have taken place. Uh, during a field um, trip to go to one of the main production sites in Argentina in Rosario, a number of the local farmers were commenting on um, two fronts. One, the impact of the drought, but two, the impact of soils, um, because they've got decreasing soil productivity, which actually impacts their short to medium term ability to maintain a consistent rate of, of yield, um, so production yield off their land. Um, add into that a prohibitive tax regime, and actually the, the whole sector and the whole economy is going to suffer, and that needs to be priced in um, to the forward sovereign bond outlook by analysts. And we didn't find, or we hardly found any analysts who are actually looking at this um, in their valuations of sovereign um, bond yields and sovereign bond um, default risk for the economy. And so these are the types of, I think, quite simple linkages that we want to be able to make and present to capital markets. So basically the link between Argentina owes a lot of dollars because of history and because of the last years, um, needs a lot of dollars and basically gets that mainly through agriculture outputs and agriculture export. And at the same time, this agriculture sector is really, really suffering because of climate change, because of uh, non-regenerative methods. So it's sort of a, a, I wouldn't say a perfect storm, but it's definitely a huge risk if you are exposed to the sovereign bonds and, and you're saying that this risk is not priced into the price of the sovereign bonds. And you're seeing these type of risks, basically. I mean, that's been the last uh, 15 years, probably, of, of your life, Mark, to finding these risks not being priced in. It's like a continuum. Sure. Yeah, no, sure. I mean, if you're an analyst, um, trying to come up with a methodology or a framework to think about how to incorporate these types of the risks that, that Matt's been describing so well, or, or scarcity risks, is, is, is quite complex. And um, if there are people who work in the accountancy profession that are listening in, um, there is a biological accounting definitions which are used um, um, by companies which are involved in, say, um, forestry or agriculture. So accountants know that when something grows, um, it, in it, it increases the value of the asset. And so you have a biological accounting framework for, for valuing that. Um, and so in the case of farmed fish, you can actually use these biological accounting techniques to come up and count how many fish there are and what they're worth. But when, you, when, when it comes to the open seas, all that accounting uh, understanding is thrown out the window and no biological accounting actually applies to natural capital because of the open seas. There's no way of defining what, what is yours um, and uh, how you find it and how you account for it. Um, and so data issues, accounting issues are complex. And, and you know, the only, the only way to solve this problem is to literally put a label on every single fish in the sea, and then you can work out who owns it, which, of course, is impossible in practice. Um, but you can see some of the challenges that we have in really properly addressing uh, from an accounting point of view, from a financial point of view. How, how can you put a value on something which you don't know who owns it, you don't know where it's located? Um, you don't know how it's going to be used. You, do, you don't know how it's going to be replaced. Uh, these are big, complex issues. And um, we're just really at the beginning, I think, of the journey of trying to understand 
um, how any of us who are involved in finance can put our arms around such a huge challenge. Because if we don't, um, um, you know, people talk jokingly, well, with some seriousness, that water will be where the new wars will start from and uh, because we haven't properly accounted for it. And there's battles between communities versus corporations for scarce assets, of which water is a classic example. And does that generate, because you mentioned you've seen in the last, uh, let's say, year or so, quite a few analysts, especially in Europe, and quite a few, let's say, financial institutions that are starting to get this. Does this mean that slowly we're getting to a place where the opportunities are becoming more interesting, like the, the one you mentioned in Japan, like actually if they would manage their fisheries sustainably, the potential is a lot bigger. Do you see more and more people looking at like this business case for regenerating a natural capital? Is that is that something you see already or is that something you would like to see, obviously? And what, is the, what do you see there to both of you, actually? We're definitely seeing opportunities around regenerative natural capital in, in terms of, sort of businesses and, and look at the positive um, impact that that has on, on investors. And I think uh, to, to use another illustration from some of our aquaculture research is at the end of last year, we launched a, a salmon briefing paper uh, looking at the global um, salmon industry and specifically uh, listed companies um, operating in the industry. And we we took the top 10 uh, listed salmon producers um, by revenue globally. And we looked, um, uh, we did a backdated analysis over the past five years. And we said, if you took their forecast production rates at the start of the year versus their actual production um, rate at the end of the year. What was what was the difference? And and we found a, a decrease of of ashios between six to eight percent um, in um, achieved versus forecast production. And we then started to look at some of the reasons behind that. And and generally, the vast majority of reasons were 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 natural in the sense of it was increased water temperature, increased um, instances of, of parasites such as sea lice, increased in, um, instances of algal blooms, which can be caused by, for example, agricultural runoff of, of fertilizers and pesticides. And so <coughs> what we're seeing is that actually the, the, the area of suitable environments for coastal salmon farming globally is shrinking. At the same time, the, the number of farms is growing. And so what we're seeing are huge advancements in the development of different types of technology, both for, for inland aquaculture, which will have a, a huge bearing if it can be achieved at a cost competitive rate um, in terms of providing protein, especially in developed markets, but also actually deep sea um, or high sea aquaculture. Now, what the capital markets need to recognize is that there is a big growth opportunity there, but the pricing and the financing of, of, these, um, of these opportunities needs to change because at current salmon prices, offshore aquaculture is completely unviable um, commercially, uh, as is inland aquaculture. So fundamentally, prices will need to increase. Uh, and so this then means that companies um, have to be able to generate more margin, but it can't be growth at all costs. We need to be looking at actually increasing the fundamental um, price of these commodities to ensure that companies are motivated and incentivized to operate more sustainably. And at the moment, history tells us that operating more sustainably can cost more money, but actually in the medium to long term, um, those costs are recovered very quickly and, and ultimately you end up with a more robust, more sustainable, more profitable business. So, so I think we are seeing really interesting opportunities available in different sectors. Oh, that's great to hear. I think a lot of people on the call would either argue that they are working on that, maybe not yet to the level of a, a publicly listed company, but hopefully in a few years. And let's say the investors on the call would probably be interested to see how to put money to work there. So I want to be conscious of your time and ask a few final questions. And one is to actually to both of you. Um, if you could wave a magic wand and tomorrow morning we wake up and either you, Mark, or you, Matt, have changed something in um, if you've changed one thing in the agriculture industry from a sustainability point of view, what would that be? Let's say the land use industry. Let's take it a bit broader and just ag. What would you both change overnight if you had the, had the power? Oh, that's such an easy question. Come on, Matt, you can do that one first. Uh, my number one issue is, I believe, soil. Uh, and how do we build agricultural and livestock systems that manage to maintain the integrity of soil? 
uh, because soil is provides the, the platform for all agricultural growth. And, and there's some excellent groups such as Soil Capital based in, in London who are doing amazing work around looking at different forms of regenerative agriculture um, and looking at soil health. And, and the soil health is fundamental to feeding the planet. So in the agriculture space, I, that, that one's quite straightforward for me. And what about you, Mark? Yeah, I, I'm going to take a different angle. Um, I do think it's possible that... Not that market mechanisms are panacea and solve all the problems. They, they, they don't. But I do think that we could build the case. A bit similar to the task force on climate-related financial disclosures that were set up, that financial regulators, and I'm thinking particularly um, stock exchange regulators and regulators governing the issuance of bonds and equities, can f- encourage any company involved in managing natural capital uh, to submit proper full and complete natural capital um, models, uh, analysis, uh, resource management plans, impact assessments as part of a, of a, a prospectus before investors invest. So you can't just say, oh, we're raising some money to log this forest until you genuinely put what the resource management plan is. Um, I don't like logging forests at all, but or, or, or even open seas fishery to the extent that it's as damaging that it is. I think that regulators could say, look, if you're going to do this, you've got to give a proper account for how you will leave the environment, uh, the open seas land in the same condition as you found it without depleting natural capital, without spoiling what nature has given us. Um, and you've got to set out how you do that. And and I think that there's a very strong rationale for that, which regulators would understand, and investors ultimately would understand. It's only part of the part of the of the way to answering the challenges we face. But I think it's an important step. I I completely agree, and I want to thank you both so much for your time this morning. And I uh, will definitely be checking in, sharing the reports that are already out there, and when new ones come out, we'll be sharing that uh, with the community. Well, thank you very much, and please. Would any any, any uh, listeners have a look at uh, the planet-tracker.org website and follow us on Twitter and do sign up. Do please sign up to our research newsletters, which are, of course, free to readers. And we look forward to exchanging information with your listeners in the future. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you. Bye-bye. If you found the Investing in Regenerative Agriculture and Food podcast valuable, there are a few simple ways you can use to support it. Number one, rate and review the podcast on your podcast app. That's the best way for other listeners to find the podcast, and it only takes a few seconds. Number two, share this podcast on social media or email it to your friends and colleagues. Number three, if this podcast has been of value to you, and if you have the means, please join my Patreon community to help grow this platform and allow me to take it further. You can find all the details on patreon.com slash regenerative agriculture or in the description below. Thank you so much and see you at the next podcast. Dear friends of the podcast, I'm super excited to share with you the online video course investing in regenerative agriculture and food. How to put money to work in regenerating soils at scale and growing a lot of tasty food while doing it. Why are we doing this course? After 100 interviews and more than 100 hours of audio asking the question how to put money to work in regenerating soils, and have been following the space since 2011 and recording this podcast since 2016, we thought it was time to share our lessons learned. What have we seen in the space over the last years? How have we built our decision-making framework? What to focus on with the podcast? How have we picked interviewees and what questions should you ask? What is happening in the space? What should you read? What should you uh, listen? What should you watch? How to approach this space? For whom is this course? You, the soy builders and investors in this space. The soy builders, people working in this space, entrepreneurial farmers, fund managers, vehicle builders, crowd investing, platform builders, ag tech companies, farm to gut food companies, permaculture, key line designers, holistic management consultants, etc., etc. People that are building soil at scale. And the investors who are putting their own money to work through their family office or as private individuals, or people who are putting other people's money to work through foundations, um, institutional capital, banks, insurance companies, etc. Is this course free? No. This is pay what you think it's worth. Meaning I have no 
way of knowing what this course will be worth to you. And I'm very aware that among the listeners of this podcast, um, we have people with very different means. So I'm inviting you, if this course is creating value to you, and if you have the means to consider paying what you think it's worth. Thank you. So what is this course? It's currently a series of 17 videos, mostly ranging from 10 to 15 minutes, plus PDF slides, so you don't have to write along. We're going to look into why invest in regenerative agriculture and why extractive agriculture is so risky, how to invest, what kind of frameworks you could and I think should build, what to invest in, and what kind of co-investors you could find, or what kind of investors you could find if you're a soy builder. Every lesson will have a digging deeper part where I will share what kind of reports, what kind of interviews, what kind of videos you can look into if you want to dig deeper. We're going to look at nutrient density, landscape design, and a lot more. So what is it not? It's not a list of investable deals. Unfortunately, that doesn't exist in this world. We're really at the beginning of the regenerative agriculture and food revolution. It's also not investment advice. Before making any investment, please find professional investment advice. So get ready, get a cup of coffee, a cup of tea or whatever you're drinking, click on the link below, sign up and I'm really looking forward to your feedback.